Okay, so as I already mentioned in the introduction, uh, my name is Carsten Trinitis, and I'm with both the Technical University in Munich in Germany, as well as with the University of Bedfordshire in the United Kingdom. And our teaching, or my teaching, mainly comprises microprocessors and computer architecture. So it's very deep into what's happening inside all those devices. We are talking about how we should use them for teaching. So we've been dealing with those things all the time. And, oops, in addition to that, sorry, that was supposed to be the pointer, um, I'm teaching history of computer science, which is sort of, did you press the key? Yeah. Uh, which is where the audience is sort of not such or doesn't have such an expertise as the computer science students, because uh, the history of computer science I also teach to uh, social science students. So that's what I learned, or where, where I first experienced how I, I needed to adjust to, to another audience. When I held my first lecture there, in front of a, a social science audience, or an audience with a social science background, they didn't understand what I was talking about. So I slowly had to adjust and, and try to find out what their background actually was by asking them questions. What do you know about computers? How long have you been using a computer? Do you understand this term? And after a while, I managed to adjust to that. But I think, yeah, one of the crucial things is to adjust to the audience, and not just to those who already know most of what you're talking about, but also to those who obviously do not understand what you're talking about. So try to get feedback from the audience. Also, we're doing several lab courses. That is more, uh, again, in the computer science stuff. And I'm also a teacher at the Uni BW, Universität der Bundeswehr, that's the German Armed Forces. So again, I have to adjust to the audience because when I get there like this, and there's the, uh, the soldiers, I have to teach, they are first a bit uh, reluctant, but uh, well, again, by adjusting to the audience, I managed to, to do that, and I got quite uh, good feedback from the students. And yeah, regarding uh, the University of Bedfordshire, since May 2010, I've been a full professor for distributed computing there, and that's where we actually uh, met at the professor's dinner. So. Thinking about how digital technology, or more generally speaking, computers, anything related to computers, should or could be incorporated into teaching, um, the first approach I did, of course, was remembering how I got into all those things. So any idea what made me start using these things, or when this happened? Yeah, I told you <laughs> yesterday. So anyone remembers this device? Normally it's white, but uh, when I had it, I was in the fire brigade, so I painted it red. <laughs> so if you wonder about the color. And actually, I took this picture uh, shortly before I came here. Um, it's uh, in the cellar in my, where I'm living. And I saw it, and I thought, oh, I have to take a picture and show it uh, in my presentation. <laughs> so that was the first, yeah. Well, the first home computer, actually, and the, the motherboard says copyright 1977. So we had a couple of those devices at school, at high school. There was a room with three of those and one uh, larger one, bigger one. And a couple of uh, yeah, high school students started uh, playing with those things, and I spent afternoon by afternoon programming those things. Even with nice web weather, we went to the computer room and some people just did uh, playing, playing games like Space Invaders, somebody might remember. But we did really some programming on there. And eventually, when this thing came out, we did more programming. I'm sure everyone knows this thing. And Eventually, um, I had a friend uh, in the physics uh, lesson, and we had to, or he had to give a talk about a, a particle accelerator. 
So I thought, how can we, or how could he present this in a way that most other students can understand it well? So I programmed an animation of this particle accelerator on a CBM computer. So what we did was we took this large, heavy device to the classroom, and I started the program, and then he gave this demonstration on how to help him with all those things, showing this on the screen, on this green uh, computer screen. But that was quite a success, and as for myself, by programming those things, and by helping this guy doing those things, my marks in physics improved exponentially. So this also helped me a lot learning the other stuff, because I was combining playing with the computer, getting into programming the computer with learning the actual stuff I was trying to, to present with the computer. It's constructivism. Yeah. <laughs> so, and later on, um, during my studies of electrical engineering, um, we had also scientific English, where I had to learn you know, quite a, some vocabulary. And there was a speech synthesizer for the Commodore 64, where you typed in. Yeah, I have it on the emulator. I'll show you later on. Um, and you said, say, and then something. And then, well, it was understandable, but it was kind of, I think it was an American accent, so you must have not liked it so much, no, I, I guess. <laughs> and I wrote a program that the computer would say, translate this word, and then I typed in the German equivalent. So by doing this, I managed to learn a lot of English American. expressions. Well, the scientific English is, should, be should be agnostic. Neutral. Yeah, neutral. And later on, um, when uh, studying several computer architectures, several computers, how they are built up, how they work, um, we used emulators. And emulators are an excellent way to, to teach computers. So when you start teaching students the basics of computer architecture, you won't start with the latest Intel Sandy Bridge 8 core whatever uh, system. You start with a very simple processor. And in order to demonstrate how this works, an emulator is an excellent way to do that. So that's also a way of how we used digital technologies for teaching, and we're still doing that. Um, also in the uh, history of science lessons I'm giving, there's lots of emulators for historical computers, which is quite interesting as well. And in addition to that, during my studies, or by the end of my studies in the late uh, 1980s, we started using writing emails to colleagues, um, doing something like uh, HTTP, there was Gopher and things like that, if anyone remembers. So we started with those things quite early and exchanged ourselves through email, exchanged documents with that. And in the late or mid 19, or in the late 1980s, nobody was talking about email, sending email. So we're doing these things, and when we showed this to friends, they were completely amazed what's going on there. So we, we've been using all those things for quite some time, and by taking a look at the development which is going on now, I sometimes think it's a bit too much. And we also had this discussion yesterday. Um, I have another slide where I will show those issues. Um, by the way, um, I also did some studies in environmental engineering, and there's, a, there's sort of a gap in between because I didn't use any computer stuff for that. But later on, when I did my PhD, of course, um, I did plenty of simulations. So that's direct applications, application of digital technology for what I was uh, writing my PhD on. And then, of course, we started using PowerPoint or OpenOffice Impress for presentations. Before that, we had those uh, overhead slides. Um, we started setting up course websites, which everyone does today, but gradually those things uh, evolved. And we had email reflectors for courses and so on. And then at our university in Munich, they started to, to set up e-learning resources. First, they have this clicks system. Don't know if you're familiar with that. Then they switched to Moodle. And for the administration and course uh, inscription, 
we used his, now we have another one called Tung Online, and so there's always been a debate which system would be the most efficient or which one should be used, and yeah, it's still not clear which technology we should use. So regarding those new gadgets, how about things like Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, Google Plus, uh, Google Hang, Hangout, Hangout, Hang Around, Hangout. <laughs> Hang around. Um, Hang around. <laughs> I'm a bit skeptical, to be honest, with all those things. And Doodle said, I think you learned how to safely use Facebook. Uh, so, no, well, as an adult, I have had to learn, but I have made mistakes. I wish I'd learned some of the skills when I was a child, but my teachers weren't able to teach me those skills because the technology didn't exist. Yeah, but so it, I, yeah. Go ahead. I have learned now. But <laughs> even if you had before, putting up the question, is it possible to safely use Facebook? I think the answer is no. I think you might be right. <laughs> Which is why I'm not on Facebook. No, of course you can't, but... Which is why, if they're going to, we need to ensure they do so right, as right. safely as possible. But what I want to say is it's very important to also teach the youngsters about the risks and the drawbacks Absolutely. of all those things. Absolutely. Facebook, Twitter, maybe, and Google+. Plus. We had this discussion yesterday. So, personally, I don't trust Google, because as a computer guy, I know what can be done with all those data Google collects and what the, what the hardware is capable of to do with all this data. So be careful with those things. As a computer scientist, I think one should uh, give this advice to colleagues as well as to, um, to the youngsters. So does it really help or does it sometimes rather distract from, from the goals? How much digital technology do we actually need? So for example, if you are in a conference and there's a boring presentation and there's a wireless LAN available, what would you do? Would you listen to the presentation or what would you do? Of course not. Check your emails, surf the internet. So is that what the conference or the goal of the conference is? Probably not. But on the other hand, it's nice if you don't need to listen to boring presentations so you can do your email. So it's always pros and cons there. So these are a few questions I want to put up here as well from a computer scientist's perspective. And actually, I wanted to give some demonstrations as well. So Gareth, if you could press on uh, that one, yeah. So anyone remembers that screen? Yes. <laughs> uh, right. So I've, um, before I came here, I, I searched the internet for some teaching software for CBM. So actually, I found some uh, programs which they used in the uh, probably in the 80s for teaching. I remember that spot. Uh, yes, one was I remember yeah. That. I remember. <laughs> and one was uh, for a Rutherford experiment. So if you press one and enter now. Oh, you're not in this. Uh, can you move the cursor? Yeah. No. OK, one, enter. So you get this animation here with this uh, nice graphics. But in those days, this was very revolutionary. So what I wrote for my friend to show this particle accelerator, quite a lot looked like this. This is not my program. Unfortunately, I don't have it anymore. So I looked for a similar one. And even in those days, they used these things for, for teaching, but probably only a tiny fraction of teachers, or probably rather the students, use those things for, for teaching purposes. Okay, and the other one, can you press on that one? Okay. That one you should know. Uh, all of eight again. Uh, all eight, sorry, yeah. And then the, the upper one. They did that one. Yeah. Yeah. Click on that and again. All eight. Uh, desktop. Commodore. Uh, 
No, sorry, recently used. That was the one here, sorry. And then the, the upper one, this, this. <laughs> the top one. The top one. And then on some, some recycle. Yeah, once, only once. So it's loading this. Uh, yeah, but now we need a sound amplifier. Anyway, this was the program which I used for the writing this uh, vocabulary stuff. Then you put a low or high memory, just press L. And then it says something like Guten Tag with an English accent, Guten Tag, it said. <laughs> For some reason, if you do run, no, if you say, if you type say and then something in inverted commas, then it would try to say this word. And that's what I used for uh, learning the vocabulary. So any idea how I managed to have those Commodore things up here? There's no Commodore computer around. Why, why do we have this C64 screen and the, the, the other one so easily? From the internet? Yeah, an emulator, exactly. And I mentioned emulators before. So if you want to teach students how those computers worked or actually how the processor works, there's lots of features you can look into the very internal stuff of those computers. You can use those emulators. Um, for computer scientists, they are a fantastic means of teaching. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.